All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our sixth Career Spotlight webinar for AJA Women and Non-Binary Voices. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Shirley Chu. I'm the uh, co-director of the Affinity Group. My pronouns are she, her. And, um, I'm talking today with Wudan Yan. And uh, Wudan, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me on the webinar. I am a freelance journalist based in Seattle, Washington. Um, I mostly write about science and health and the environment um, for uh, magazines and newspapers. Um, and a lot of my reporting happens overseas and the rest uh, from my desk here in Seattle. And Wudan, what are your pronouns? Oh, right. Uh, she, her. Okay, great. So just so everyone knows, we'll start with an interview portion and leave some time for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions that come up, um, you can post them in our Facebook event, tweet with the hashtag AAJA Hangout, or you can just drop them in the chat in Zoom um, and we'll get to them at the very end. So let's get started. Uh, could you start by just telling us a bit about your career path? Uh, yeah. So my start and career in journalism uh, wasn't necessarily uh, conventional. So I started in journalism about five and a half years ago at this point. And before that, I was on a pretty uh, straight academic track. I was uh, at Sloan Kettering, which is a cancer research institute in New York City. And I was uh, in a PhD program for cancer biology because that's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so uh, about early 2014, I made the leap between uh, academia and science research and uh, to journalism. And at first it was science journalism that really grabbed my attention. So when did you know that you wanted to make the switch from studying science to writing about it? That's a really fascinating question because I'm not actually sure when that moment was. I do remember in my first year of a PhD program, uh, and most commonly during your first year of a PhD program, you're in classes all the time. And so I was going through my classes and um, that whole year made me realize that it was possible to be at once bored and challenged. Um, bored meaning that, you know, learning about different aspects of cancer biology wasn't particularly interesting to me and yet I was so challenged by um, the course material and um, what I was spending a lot more time on was not reading the journal papers that I was assigned for my coursework but a lot of magazine stories a lot of narrative nonfiction books um, etc and uh, about a year into my PhD program I attended a talk at the World Science Festival which is held in New York City every year and one of the talks was called science and story and um when i after coming out of that talk i realized that science writing wasn't just a hobby it was actually a career and it felt like this new door in hogwarts or something had opened and that i just had no idea about and i wanted to learn more about it Awesome. So how did you decide that journalism was the route you wanted to take? I think one issue I had with the PhD program is that we're supposed to stay focused to a project um, for six, perhaps even more times than that. And um, I think over the years, I realized that I don't quite have the attention span to focus on a six year project. And I thought journalism would be a cool way for me to explore a lot of different curiosities concurrently um, on shorter time scales and possibly be even more rewarding in disseminating what I found through my story research and interviews um, to a lay audience. So what was that transition like going from studying science to freelance journalism? Did you take any courses or have any trainings or anything in between? Mm -hmm. So uh, no, I kind of jumped right in and I think about this a lot and I don't think I would have done it any other way. Um, I kind of understood there were two paths or maybe just one. 
and then maybe some uh, more um, peripheral ways to get into science journalism. So the one track I knew existed was you go to a science writing program, you go to journalism school, you come out, you already have connections, you probably have done a few internships, you have clips um, at magazines and newspapers, and you can probably find more opportunities. Um, the other way was to hack your way in kind of unconventionally. And as I was plotting my escape from grad school, I spoke to a woman, um, another freelance writer who was in Brooklyn, and she basically told me that another way to get into science journalism was to um, apply for internships. Just put my name out there, identify publications. Uh, so I was living in New York City at the time, which is a huge advantage since there's so many publications there. Um, reach out to editors at those publications, you know, explain my background and interest and ask, are they looking for any additional help? Um, and that was, well, that was, I guess, I don't believe in breaks in this field, but um, that's probably, uh, I was given an, an opportunity to set up the table, and that was with a Nautilus magazine. So did you know from the start that you wanted to be a freelancer, or did you think about joining a newsroom? Mm -hmm. So yes, after my internship at Nautilus finished up, so that was a three-month stint. And I came in as somebody who did not know a thing about journalism, and they had me start out with fact checking. So fact checking is great because it's an, it's an, it was amazing transition from science research because fact checking was also research. It was story research. And from that story research, I could see how many more experienced writers built narrative stories that put science in the context of culture and politics um, and emotion that was really powerful and compelling. And um, now I'm forgetting your question. What did you ask? Uh, if, you, if you always knew you wanted to freelance or whether you wanted oh, to go right. the newsroom route. Right, that's right. So um, after I finished that internship, I started looking to see what other opportunities were there. Because th th there is this idea that like, okay, you'll just go from one internship to another. And a lot of staff jobs that I was looking at, um, said that they wanted like three to five years of experience. And I wasn't really sure how I was gonna get that in the first place, if there wasn't um, a surefire way for me to go from like one internship into a staff job at that same newspaper or magazine or not. Um, so I thought that the best way to get that experience would be via freelancing. Gotcha. So you've done a lot of big stories, a lot of international reporting, uh, what first drew you to, or what drew you to your first international story? Yeah, sure. So um, the book that really drew me into science journalism is a book called Spillover by David Quammen, who's a contributing writer to National Geographic. And Spillover is about the movement of pathogens from animals into humans. Scary things like Ebola or maybe things we haven't really heard about like hantavirus. And it wasn't just a story about infectious disease, it was also an adventure story. And I remember going to a talk in New York City, it was a, it was a science conference, but there was an infectious disease researcher from Columbia who showed a map of infectious disease hotspots. And um, so, so the color scale was like red, very infectious disease, blue, pretty benign. Um, and Southeast Asia was just like this fiery red. <laughs> and uh, I somehow decided that that would be a cool place for me to figure out, you know, what it was like. I mean, the thing that kind of frustrated me about being in New York was that a lot of science journalists were working on very similar stories and not really um, looking past, you know, embargoed press releases or um, it, it, it felt very homogenous as to the news as to the science coverage um, that was being done by a lot of reporters based in New York. And I wanted to break out of that. And um, so after freelancing in New York for about a year and a half, uh, I moved to Bangkok. Wow, you just up and moved without like a timeline <laughs> or anything? Yeah, I, um, well, I was, I didn't study abroad in college. And so I was like, okay, I kind of owe it to myself to try this out. And what a cool way to learn about the world that we live in. 
um, if not through journalism. So um, it was an open-ended trip. I booked a one-way ticket. I remember just having come back from a trip to China with my parents and um, oh, about a week before I left for Thailand, I was like, hey, by the way, I'm doing this thing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was clearly a thought through decision. I had thought about it for months in advance. Um, on the surface, I think it seemed a little, you know, the thing that you do in your early 20s when you're still trying to figure you and your own career out. Um, but yeah. Gotcha. So have any of your international stories been grant funded? Um, how did you support yourself when you were doing that? Sure. So um, when I first moved to Thailand, that trip was not grant funded. Um, I didn't really know anything about the grants world. And um, I supported myself by doing copywriting and other short news stories that would, I mean, the cost of living in Thailand, including my rent and some travel, wasn't really going to exceed $1,500 a month. So um, I didn't have to make that much money to sustain my overhead wasn't very high for me to try to find the stories and to report the stories that I was most interested in. Um, and I think this is really key for people who are thinking about going abroad or who want to get this experience. It's like, what's an interesting place that won't slow your budget? I mean, I had money saved up. I took on copywriting. I took short assignments that gave me the time and freedom and a financial cushion for me to sort of go out into the wild and um, see what I could find. What about later on? Did you start looking into grants? Yeah, so um, that first four months that I was living in Bangkok, um, I spent a lot of time looking into the issue of palm oil. Um, and basically what happened was that I didn't have enough time to report that series of stories out when I was there the first time around. So four months in Bangkok, I moved back to the US, I moved to Seattle. And I applied for grants to basically support um, another trip back out there. And um, so now we're in 2016, the summer, no, uh, fall of 2016, um, I had a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting uh, to go back to Southeast Asia and look into, you know, what sustainable palm oil really meant. Gotcha. Do you have any advice for people who are looking for grants or applying for grants on what that process was like and how you got it? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think people talk a lot about this, but you do have to court two people at the same time. I mean, you have to make sure that there's a story. So as a freelancer, I'm pitching my editor or, you know, cold pitching editors, many of them um, at different publications to see who's interested. And secondly, I'm also trying to figure out if the available grants um, are interested in the stories that I'm in. So um, that usually is an email to uh, a program manager or an editor at one of the granting institutions um, saying, hey, do you have anything like this in the pipeline? Um, if not, would you consider a project like this? Um, I'd love to throw my, I'd love to throw an application your way. Um, and concurrently with, you know, with editors that sort of, you know, <laughs> open the doors at these publications, um, a lot of them are not going to fund travel for a writer that's new to them. Um, so having a grant, I think, was really key for me to break into some of these publications. Um, and so when I applied for the Pulitzer grant, I had letters of support from multiple editors who basically said, you know, Wu Dan and I discussed the story idea. We think it's really compelling. Um, we hope that, you know, this money comes through so she can figure out what the story is. We'd be happy to publish anything that comes from this trip. Um, and I mean, that gives assurance to the, the granting agency that their money will just not be thrown away. Mm -hmm. Were there a bunch of organizations you applied to, or did you kind of focus in on a few? Mm -hmm. So over the years, um, I've received funding from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. I've gotten funding from, uh, it's Michael Pollan's Food and Farming Fellowship out of UC Berkeley, um, which is a really sweet program if you have a good food and farming story for radio or print. 
Um, I have applied for funding uh, through the Institute of Journalism and Natural Resources. That sponsored a recent trip to the Southwest um, where I looked into the nuclear history in the United States. Um, other grants that are that exist and I've applied to and haven't received, um, the International Women's Media Foundation has so, so many grants um, every single year, some for reporting trips. Um, the Food Environment Reporting Network supports stories. Um, and National Geographic also has um, some, some requests for proposals from time to time. Cool. So based on my own conversations with people, uh, journalists and non-journalists, being a foreign journalist or a foreign correspondent is sort of seen as this glamorous job, you know, very cool. Um, and it is, but it's also tough work. Can you talk about sort of both sides of that, like the challenges and the rewards of reporting internationally? Yeah, so I'll start with um, the rewards. I mean, they're I wouldn't say they're obvious. So we already talked about this aspect that it seems glamorous. Um, I mean, it's so rare to be able to be boots on the ground in for a lot of stories that are published, um, especially as more publications become digital, especially as budgets shrink and so do magazine and newspapers travel budgets. Um, so again, that's the benefit of applying for a grant. Um, the, I mean, I would say the other advantage is sometimes when you're working on really sensitive story topics, for instance, I'm thinking about the reporting I've done at the Rohingya refugee camp. Um, it's so important to have that face-to-face -face time with the sources with whom you're cultivating trust and respect. And um, I mean, those are also people who are kind of wary of the media. And uh, these are just not things that you would be able to get on the ground. I'm uh, sorry, over the phone. I mean, so, and, you know, when, when we talk, I, I've talked a little bit about travel reporting on and off over the years, but travel reporting can really be as simple as stepping out your front door and like knocking on people's doors or going to a community event. Um, and it's a really great, amazing way to uh, like physically make a connection with somebody else. That sounds creepy, but just the, that face to face interaction, I think, goes a really, really long way. Um, for me, that's, you know, the real advantage of reporting for travel. Um, and also like the scenes, the color, the color that you're able to bring into a story. Um, I mean, yes, so the flip side is that they are incredibly long days and you don't have control over your schedule. Um, or can be, yes, they, they can be really long days and you can have no control over your schedule. And I mean, if you're uh, like, chasing a developing story or you're not sure what the story is and you're working in um, a place where security is a concern, um, you might have to just be on the move constantly depending on what geopolitical factors are at play. Um, that's what I mean by you don't have control over your schedule. Um, reporting days are also really long days. So after, you know, say, four hours total on the back of a motorbike and three interviews in the field. And um, I get back and it's nine or 10 PM. I am so obsessive about downloading my brain at the end of the day and taking all my notes and typing them up. And like um, in my notes, I'll have small time stamps for quotes that I might want to use later on. So I want to have those transcri transcribed because I don't like to transcribe once I'm home. Um, I actually find it, to be too cumbersome. Um, so, right, uh, it, it makes for very long days. And um, one thing I've realized over the years is that travel feels increasingly more exhausting. And my tolerance for red eye flights, for instance, has gone down also dramatically. So um, it is a lot of wear, but I think it really creates for amazing opportunities and beautiful stories. So how has being a, a woman affected your work, both domestically and internationally? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, I also, I almost want to talk more about what being a person of color has meant for my job. Because I think when I am abroad, people don't really know what to do with me. So in Southeast Asia, um, 
I, so I am Chinese American. I was born in China, but in Southeast Asia, I kind of look like I could just be native to a given country. Um, and that, that's great for two reasons, because most of the time I just want to blend in. And secondly, I think when sources see somebody who looks like them, um, they seem to just trust and open up to me a lot more. Um, reporting in the U.S., I mean, that's a really hard question because I don't have anything overwhelmingly negative or positive to say about it. Um, I, I'm trying to think because I recently was reporting in the Southwest and um, I would say in the U.S. it's generally way stranger to report in communities that are not your own. And I feel so much more like an outlier. So I was in the Southwest, a lot of rural places, a lot of Native American reservations. Um, I mean, if nobody looks at my face, I can still pass, but um, that's not really the goal. The goal is once you're not in a community in the United States and you go to a different one, people are kind of like, what are you doing here? Um, I, I would say it has nothing to do with a woman or a person of color, really, but I feel like those differences, those like deer and headlights are a lot more pronounced um, when I work in the U.S. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I am curious about is how you balance some of those bigger stories, those international stories, uh, while still making a living as you're as you're working on these longer term projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean it. It's a lot of preparation for an international trip, no matter how you cut it, because as a freelancer, you're likely. Um, fronting a lot of money. So that is the cost for an international flight. That is the cost for translators, fixers. Um, I would say on average, let's say, um, my most recent trip to the Southwest was a little over $2,000, which was half funded by a grant and half funded by a magazine. Um, but I had to pay for all of that basically up front. And so I'm on, this week, I'm on the road for three to four weeks. I come back, but I'm also not working on any other assignments when I'm on the road just because it's so challenging to be immersed in one world, the reporting world, and also feeling like you have to be on the phone and take on shorter turnaround assignments. Um, I would say it's almost nearly impossible, and I don't know anyone else who does that very well. Um, so... Yeah, it, it, it is almost a lot of financial planning to be able to do that. So um, I basically try and take on as many assignments as possible in advance um, to really build that buffer in my bank account. This sounds so procedural and boring, but um, I feel like this is, you know, how, because, because the thing that could happen is you come back for a trip and you're like, shit, I'm so broke. <laughs> I just spent all this money, like chasing this passion project, and now, I'm going to file this magazine story and then it's going to be an edit for two months. So it's really three more months after I see a few thousand dollars and I need money to pay my rent like yesterday. Um, I mean, these are just really practical things and I think uh, stuff to consider just generally. And it goes back to financial planning as a freelancer, which is a whole separate topic. Um, but when I'm home, I am working on news stories. I am a magazine fact checker for various different outlets. Um, I am working on features that don't need to be uh, done in the field. I am working on planning out, um, you know, my, my trip, in, like my once a month trip in the next like six months. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it does require a lot of planning. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're just joining our call now, I wanted to remind everyone we're speaking with Wu Dan Yan today and um, if you have any questions for her, you can post them in the Zoom chat directly, or you can tweet with the hashtag AAJA Hangout, um, or post them in our Facebook event. So, Wudan, you wrote a Medium post earlier this year detailing the struggle to get paid as a freelancer. Uh, for those who haven't read the piece, could you talk about your experience with that and what you wrote about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So um, I believe it was the summer, sometime in August, I self-published a piece about how um, 
three different clients owed me about a total of $5,000 and none of it was paid out on time. And, you know, on the surface, the story is about, um, the story is about the struggles of getting paid, but on a deeper level, it is how not seriously people take freelancers. And um, I thought that came across to be very evident in a lot of the exchanges that I had with accounts payable people, um, editors. Uh, it feels like, you know, they can get paid every two weeks or a month or whatever regular basis they're paid on. And yet um, they sort of leave freelancers out to dry and don't really want to resolve anything quickly. Um, so that was the story. I think, you know, the most misunderstood thing about it is that I didn't really want to write it. Um, the thing that I feel like I'm wired to do is to call out bad behavior. And maybe that's why I'm so attracted to the field of journalism because I can't look, like, it is my professional responsibility to do that. Um, so this, this was no different. Um, this really was no different. It was just my own experience. And people complain about this all the time. And we subtweet about it. We talk about it in closed circles. Um, but I felt like self-publishing a piece on this topic was the right choice because things in this industry really have to change if we are to be honest about the longevity and sustainability of freelance journalism or freelance writing or freelance anything. So was this something you had sort of seen a pattern of experiencing before and what made you decide to write this piece at the point that you did? Mm -hmm. I mean, personally speaking, I have other clients have been late to pay me smaller amounts and, but it's never gotten to such a big dollar amount. And the thing that really sent me into panic was that um, I expected this $5,000 to come on a month that I plan to take off from work. So I wasn't just five, and let's just say $5,000 is my target income per month. I wasn't just short 5,000, I was actually short 10,000. Cause I hadn't just, I, I, I wasn't working for that last month. I was quote unquote off. Um, and that sent me into panic in essence. And I feel like, this, I feel like this isn't uncommon, right? And um, so that I would say that was the real tipping point, um, the dollar amount and the fact that it, it, it seems so excessive. I mean, sometimes I've been late $1,000, but, you know, I'm also working and I can c continue to bring in income. Um, there's still money coming. I'm not you know, being short a thousand dollars is a little different from being short ten thousand dollars. For sure. So did this piece, uh, either your experiences negotiating with people at these organizations or after you published this piece, has that hurt any of your professional relationships? Um, with the three clients that I mentioned, I think yes. For one of the clients, it was very obvious that that was hurt. The other two, um, you know, the thing that I decided after writing it was that if people can't treat me with respect, then I'm just not going to write for them. <laughs> I mean, it, it, sounds, it sounds crazy for me as a freelancer to say that because we never, like, th there are so many clients out there. There's a small number of really good ones. Um, and, you know, the more you mentally cut clients out or come up with your own, like, whatever, uh, list of blacklisted publications that pay late, um, the, the potential places for you to publish is smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, I mean, that to an extent was scary, but just in terms of, you know, uh, of wanting to be treated the way that others should be treated. Like, I, I think that just comes to a very basic, I mean, if freelancers were to have human rights, I would say timely payment is a human right. Um, and yeah, it's just inhumane and I just decided that I wouldn't really settle for that anymore. So, um, the three publications, which I did not name in that piece, uh, I just sort of mentally filed as I won't write for them. If other people have questions about them, like 
I would probably share my experience because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, but yeah. So what kind of feedback have you heard following that piece from, from others? Yeah, I, um, an editor, editor in chief of a publication uh, who I have recently worked with was like, you know, that's horrible. A lot of other freelancers um, also started posting about how they've been stiff payments. They, uh, publications have paid them late. Um, some other people, so, so on top of getting paid late, I tried to impose late fees. And late fees are not only a penalty, um, and they're not, well, let me put it this way, they're not just interest. So say like a publication owes me $1,000, that's not on time, okay, now I have to account for interest on my rent and on my credit cards. It's not just that, it's also a penalty and it's the emotional labor. <laughs> um, and the cost of me having to put together a diplomatic email demanding that I needed to be paid. And, um, you know, in New York City, for, for freelancers based in New York City or publications based in New York City, uh, freelancers are entitled to, to, to be paid double according to the freelancers at free law. And a lot of people on the internet were giving me a hard time about things. They thought that 20% was really high. And um, I eventually did the math and it came out that it's not that high for the penalties that I would have to incur on rent and my credit card statements. Because what that late fee, uh, what that, what those late payments really are, are these publications taking out an interest-free loan from us. Um, so that was, that really got under my skin. Um, and I would say, you know, I think, I think it got editors to listen up too. Um, I mean, this is the beauty and the terror of Twitter is that when something like this is shared, everyone, I mean, that piece went viral and I was both surprised and not surprised by it. Um, but I think it got a lot of people to listen. Um, just among some other freelancers I know have told me about imposing late fees on late invoices, which is incredible and what I'm trying to go for because, you know, for, for me as one person to go out to three different publications, you know, these accounts table, my editors can think, this is a blip. Wudan's being quote unquote unreasonable. Like people are just on vacation. It was summer. Um, but it's not that. It's if you continue to do this, your publication is going to continue losing money if freelancers are diligent about charging late fees. Um, and so <laughs> the cost of not paying your freelancers on time is eventually going to get so high that that's just not worth it. You might as well just pay your people on time. That's where I was really hoping that this conversation would go. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that a lot of people are trying to push for late fees. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any larger impacts from an institutional perspective or editor perspective uh, following your piece? Hmm. Um, not really. And I, yeah, I saw that question on the list and I wasn't sure, you know, how I would know about that or how that would even be measured. Um, but, you know, I have really frank conversations. I mean, because of the way the internet works, there's no hiding that I am the person who wrote that late fee story. And sometimes I get caught in conversations with editors about, you know, story fees, like, can I get an advance? Um, what happens if it's late, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're all on my side, especially those who ha have freelance or frequently work with freelancers, they kind of get it. Um, so I'm not sure. And maybe it's, you know, because I've cut out the clients who don't pay on time and who I've just decided I'm not going to work for. Um, I have self-selected the small bubble of clients that will treat me humanely. So, um, to me, superficially, it seems like everything's fine. Yeah. So uh, one last thing I want to talk about before we get to audience questions is I saw that you're starting a business podcast for freelancers. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, my a friend, colleague, and somebody who I look up to a lot and I 
um, are starting a podcast to launch in January 2020, which is really soon. Neither of us had made a podcast or done any audio work, so it should be a huge adventure. It's called the Writers Co-op, and um, our tagline is a business podcast for freelance writers everywhere. And um, so my co-host is Jenny Gritters, and she's a badass. Um, about a year and a half ago, she was laid off from Wirecutter, and she went, okay, I guess I'm going to go freelance. And she made over six figures in her first year of freelancing. And that is, I would hedge a guess to say that it's almost unheard of. Um, so, I mean, she's really smart on the business side. I think I'm very smart on different sides, such as grant writing, negotiating contracts, um, freelancer rights, et cetera. So um, basically, we hope that it's a blueprint for um, writers who want to go freelance, or I guess just journalists generally, because this industry is so volatile, we don't know where the next layoffs are going to come from, um, how feasible it is to continue finding staff jobs, or if we have to go freelance. So um, yeah, we'll talk about making a business plan, uh, self-care, um, work-life balance, uh, finding clients, negotiating contracts, or figuring out what the hell is all the legalese in your contract. Um, things of that sort. So we're launching a first season next year and hopefully more to come. Awesome. Is this, so this is more of like a passion project and not, <clears throat> it, is it funded currently by anything or? Yeah, so <laughs> we are applying for funding. I am putting together a grant and sometimes I realize that my life as a journalist is not that much different from an academic because I feel like I'm always applying for grants. Um, we're applying for a grant. Uh, we are thinking about crowdfunding some of our first episodes, um, but we do have a newsletter. It's the writers co-op, all one word, dot substack, dot com. Um, and you can sign up there and we'll keep you posted on updates. Uh, but yeah, it's exciting. Kind of a passion project. Um, bought a condenser mic the other day. Been playing around with it. Not really sure how it works. So it should be fun. Awesome. Well, I'll drop the link in the chat here in case people want to check it out. And we'll get to reader questions or audience questions. So Taylor says, how do you handle language barriers and cultural differences when you're traveling to other countries? Sure. So uh, the cultural differences is something that I try to research before going somewhere new. Um, I want to know if well, a lot of places I travel to are in Southeast and Southeast Asia, which means it's usually very hot. And my general inclination when I'm home is to wear tank top and shorts. Um, that's not acceptable and not nearly as professional as you would have to look. Um, and in a lot of places that are Muslim, Buddhist, you have to cover your shoulders, you have to cover your knees. Um, uh, I like to know if I'm in a place that I have to take my shoes on and off a lot. Um, which makes me with which impacts my shoe buying decisions when traveling to a place. Um, so I, yeah, I would say that's the thing that I researched the most before traveling somewhere internationally. What are the cultures and norms that I, as a woman, need to follow? Um, and as for the language barriers, I'm usually working with a, I'm hiring a translator or a fixer, depending on what my needs are. Um, that's a good question because some people ask me, well, do I need a translator or do I need a fixer? Um, the answer is that it depends. So a translator is somebody who I would recommend hiring if you know where you're going and uh, you know who you're interviewing and that person solely serves as a translator. A fixer is somebody who you want to hire where, um, say, for instance, security is an issue, you don't really know where you're going, and you need your help, you need help from your fixer to find sources, um, and or arrange travel in a place that you're unfamiliar with. Um, and a fixer, one of their responsibilities also includes being a translator. Um, so that's sort of one thing I think about the distinction. But uh, yeah, I'm almost always working with at least a translator when I'm abroad. Great. And the second question we have from Anurag. I hope I pronounced that relatively okay. Um, how do you evaluate whether an international story idea fits an American publication? And how do you decide how and when to kill an idea? Wow. Uh, okay. So basically, after um, Trump took office, I 
noticed a serious decline in international stories, unless they were about U.S.-Mexico relations, North Korea, China, Russia, maybe, maybe sometimes the Middle East, which really cuts out nearly all the areas that I report on. So, I mean, that's our, so, so mentally that creates a really high bar for me to cross when I'm looking for story ideas. Um, that is, is, so, so basically what I'm saying is those stories really have to be attention grabbing in some way, shape or form. And one way that I really recommend freelance writers to pitch editors is to send a, um, like a very short pitch query, especially with editors who you already have relationships with. Um, for instance, when I was going to Kazakhstan, uh, this was last fall, I wrote an editor that I know, knew um, and had worked with, and they said, in essence, hey, I'm going to Kazakhstan. I came across this story. This is the one sentence summary. Is this something you would be interested in? And I mean, I can't afford to, I guess I can say waste time because time is money. I can't afford to waste time chasing stories that are not going to pan out to publication at this point. Um, and I think, you know, when I was earlier in my career, I had a lot of ideas that, you know, not everyone was a feature story or required, not everyone was a feature story, but required some amount of travel. And I thought at the time that was justifiable so I can build out my portfolio to show that I'm capable of doing that travel. Um, I, I would say that's sort of not the case anymore. And um, yeah, don't travel without a commission or a grant because you're going to lose a lot of money. And I don't think that's a really smart financial decision. Obviously, a lot of other factors weigh into this. Um, but what was the second part to that question? How do you know when oh, to kill it? Yeah. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm like soft pitching, so that's like the one paragraph query and nobody's fighting, then I'm like, I'm just not going to do it. Got it. Well, I think that's all of our questions. Thank you so much, Wudan, for joining us today. I know that as a freelancer, your time is very valuable. So we appreciate you. And thanks everyone for tuning in today. This is our last webinar of the year. So um, we really appreciate you as well. And I uh, hope you have a good rest of your Monday. Thanks for doing this, Shirley. No problem. Bye. All right. See you.